Quantum Technologies is really a vision that has emerged over the past few decades, and it's about applying some of the most profound concepts of quantum mechanics to information technologies. Before digging a little bit into that, I would like to begin by uh, actually uh, addressing and discussing some of the societal challenges we're facing today. And one example is drug discovery. And if you look at what pharmaceutical companies do today, they often need to go through huge classes of proteins, for example, such as this one shown here in the background. It's an antibody protein. And typically, you need to go through many of them by meticulous trial and error, because there's no way you can solve the governing equations with current computers. And it's kind of interesting, because from one perspective, it's just a molecule. And you would think that, OK, molecules have been known for a long time. But the complexity is simply huge. And it's really beyond what, is, uh, what can be handled on, on current computers. And I should perhaps add, on any computer with the current computational paradigm. Another example, which I think is really becoming a key issue in our highly digital societies, is cybersecurity. And these are just some recent uh, news items that popped up. For example, Yahoo had a data breach now four years ago. And when I say it's recent, it's because they just recently announced that this did not affect just a few of their accounts. It affected all of their accounts. It affected three billion accounts. And they just figured out the full extent of it now. Europol is actually now reporting that, the, that cybercrime has become more common than conventional crimes. I think this is something to, for all of us to really reflect upon. It's maybe not a big surprise that since the internet is becoming a, a preferred playground for innovators, but it's also becoming a preferred playground for criminals. Now, I would like to suggest that some of the solutions to this might be quantum. And quantum mechanics is this weird theory that was developed in, around the world around a century ago. The epicenter of the development was Niels Bohr and his colleagues in the Copenhagen. And it, it really tells us a number of truly remarkable things. And one of them is that waves and particles are kind of the same thing, or at least two sides of the same coin. That's really, really different from our classical world. If you have water waves, they can interfere and form an interference pattern. But if you have like solid objects, such as two ships, and they sail into each other, you would not expect them to mo move through each other in some kind of wavy motion. You would have a much more radical effect. So in fact, waves and particles are not only different, they're really opposite in the classical world. Yet, in the quantum world, they're kind of the same thing. And another way of saying that is that quantum particles can be at different places at the same time. And this is a truly profound and, and weird thing, uh, nevertheless a well-established fact. Um, it is something that governs the atomic world, the world of individual quantum particles, but it is not something that applies to the classical world, right? I cannot be here and at the same time work in my lab in Copenhagen. Now, if you then take information and store that, information always has a physical representation. It can be stored as a charge in your RAM, or it can be uh, a magnetic configuration in your, an old school hard drive or whatever, it is always physical. Now, what if I store my information in a quantum object? Then I'm not looking at a bit that is either 0 or 1. I'm looking at a bit that can be 0 and 1 at the same time. And what that tells you is 
that there is an inherent parallelism in quantum computers, where quantum algorithms can go through entire data res registers in parallel in, in one computational cycle. What it also does is it enables building unbreakable crypto systems. If you communicate not by large pulses of photons, as you do today, for example, across the Atlantic Ocean and fiber optic cables, but instead of having tens of thousands of photons or billions of photons, but have one photon, you can build unbreakable crypto systems. Now, if you think this is all a little weird, you're in good company. Uh, Einstein hated quantum mechanics. He spent 30 years trying to disprove it. Eventually, it resulted in some of the most uh, solid evidence for quantum mechanics, and today it is by far the most precise scientific theory. Niels Bohr loved it uh, and was in many ways the godfather of it, and this is what he said about it. Anyone who's not shocked by quantum theory has not understood it. Now, coming back to the potential of quantum computers, this view graph here shows the internal data capacity in a quantum register as a function of the number of quantum bits. And you can see if you only have like a handful of quantum bits, it's actually not a very useful thing. We'll say a dozen of quantum bits, you have about a kilobyte of internal capacity. But if you can ramp that up to around 70, the amount of information is equivalent to the amount of information ever stored by humankind. However, I want to stress that while this is indeed tantalizing, this does not tell you what kind of algorithm you use, and it does not tell you how hard it actually is to build such a thing. I think it's fair to say that building a quantum computer is perhaps the most daring engineering challenge of our century. Nevertheless, it is also something that, of course, has a huge business potential. And today, lots of companies are investing in it, lots of R&D labs and universities are working on it. But I, want, I really want to stress that it's early days. This is not like what happened to the semiconductor industry, when we all agreed that it should be silicon and it should be integrated circuits, and things really took off since the 70s. This is before that. This is the early days. We don't even know what's a platform. Should it be superconducting circuits? It looks very promising at the moment. Google and IBM are working on that. Should it be some very exotic particles known as Majorana fermions? This is what Microsoft is investing quite heavily in at the moment. Or ion traps or photons? We don't know yet. So here's my take on a roadmap of quantum technologies. I think the future is high-performance computing. It's not going to be today. It's not going to be tomorrow. But I think it's going to be. Much sooner than that, we will see a need for unbreakable crypto systems that can only be done by quantum technologies. However, a big challenge in the quantum area at the moment is really finding near-term revenue. Because although you can do lots of interesting research, ultimately, this is spending somebody else's money. And if we really are to deliver on some of these promises, we need to, to provide short-term paths to revenue. And what we are looking at is the R&D market. This is really targeting all those industry labs, all those researchers who are currently building and investigating many different types of quantum technologies. And a key component for that is a single photon light source. And that's what we're developing at Sparrow Quantum. So you might then ask, we are constantly bathed in so much light. I am standing here bathed in billions and billions, yet billions of photons. Is it really so difficult to get just one? Can I just put on a pair of sunglasses? And if it's not enough, another pair? and just add more pairs of sunglasses until there's only one left? Well, it's kind of true. I could do that, and I could get to a point where I have, for example, one photon on average. But what I will never get 
is one photon at a time. I want to train photons coming predictably, deterministically. That cannot be done using lasers or incandescent light sources, LEDs, or the brightest light source we have, the sun. Neither of them deliver single photons. So last year, we introduced the world's first commercially available single photon source. It is a nanophotonic chip that combines various tricks developed over a decade of research into funneling the photons emitted from a quantum dot single photon emitter into an optical fiber. What we're currently working on is shown to the right. That is an integrated system, a turnkey single photon system. So one might then ask, is this going to be the revolution of information technologies? Is, and even if it is, is photons going to be the winning strategy? I don't know, but I would like to conclude by showing you uh, my favorite quote by Nils Bohr, and it goes like this. He said that the opposite of a correct statement is a false statement, but the opposite of a profound truth may well be another profound truth. I'll be around for the rest of the afternoon if you have any questions, and I'd like to thank you for your attention.